good morning everyone i officially welcome you all to the webinar the future of the enterprise hr's role in leading the change this is our sixth consecutive online webinar which we have conducted in past few weeks and uh, it has been a very successful journey we have taken aboard uh, like hundreds of people in every webinar and it has been a very successful journey for us today before i hand over the session to our main main faculty mr ron thomas i am going to give you a little brief about how the session going to be happening what's what what's going to be the flow before i hand over him some of the areas which are number 1 we will be having the q and a uh, during the session and after the session subject to the time availability but for this uh, you have the option to raise the hand when you will raise the hand i will note down those names and i will be uh, you know giving the opportunity to answer ask your questions during the session uh, one by one uh, by first come first serve basis uh, you all are requested to stay mute during the session because uh, when the trainer will be speaking it is better that uh, the entire entire participants remain in mute so that the uh, program doesn't get disrupted number 3 those who are not able to attend the session for any reason they will be provided a recorded video link uh, so that they can cover the everything that is being discussed today after that so it's not going to be an issue all right now over to you ron best of luck okay thank you good morning everyone um as i say uh, let me just get my slides over here um welcome to the new normal uh and what we're dealing with um So what we'll do today is spend some time talking about um, HR's role. Look at HR's role in trying to basically leading this change, leading the rebirth, because it's a two-pronged approach. There's crisis management and there's recovery management. What happens when we get back to normal? Uh, here in Dubai, uh, we've been locked down for about three weeks now. Everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens when the announcement comes out over the weekend. We literally have to ask for a permit to step outside. So it gives us time to reskill. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that because we are in the driver's seat now. When I say we, I mean people in our profession are in the driver's seat. Um so we've always heard that phrase about uh and i hate it by the way is is talking about having a seat at the table uh well that's going to be imperative that we have that seat now because how are we going to guide through the thicket of getting back to the new normal whatever whatever shape that may be what scenarios are you working on what policies are you reviewing um I'm using my time to read a lot. I belong to quite a few uh, basically all of the, uh, the the major websites from McKinsey, uh Con Ferry, whatever. And there was an article came across this is on my reading list for today um and it's based on strategy disruption and how do you uh refocus the organization? Uh you may have had two or three strategic initiatives those could possibly change and in human resources we're supposed to be connected and I'll talk to that with a slide that's coming up as to how we sh we should be connected to that strategy but one of the things that kind of this heartens me when i talk to professionals when i pose the question what is your organization strategy can you name two or three initiatives and i get kind of the hr look and you possibly know what that means is that i don't have a clue um so we can talk about ourselves because we're all in the same boat and it kind of disheartens me because i say that we should be viewed as business people and we never want to be viewed as hr people if we be viewed as business people uh we're seen as problem solvers through the lens of human resources so we're going to spend the next hour and we're going to have to set aside some time for q and a to kind of talk through you know what we're facing what we will be facing moving forward i want to start with this quote from a, a buddy of mine josh burson 
Today's HR must have the ability to analyze and interpret data used to help business leaders understand workforce needs and incorporate results into strategy, workforce strategy and planning. It's, no, it's very, very appropriate today because when we start back, the remodel or the business model that we had pre-virus is possibly going to change. Some companies have, have never offered uh, work from home. Now people are working from home and now leaders are saying that people can still produce if they're home. Um, all of these things are gonna change. Work, work, work uh, employees' expectations. All of these people in our workforce is going to be looking for guidance. Our senior leaders are going to be looking for us for guidance because this is in an area they may not have spent time on as it relates to human capital. So as I said, we're in the driver's seat and we should take this time to prepare. So here's a slide I love, I call it, you know, I tell people sometimes when they ask me, what, what do you do? I said, I'm a workforce architect and they don't know what that is. And they'll say, wow, I've never heard, quite heard of that title. So I come back to them by saying, you have that department in your organization. Every organization has a team of workforce architects. And they're looking at me as if I'm clueless. But when I reference the point, they sit inside of your human resources department or your human capital department. They give me a look as if I'm crazy. And I've even heard them say, oh, my HR department could never be considered a workforce architect. So I won't go into the reasons for that. But when I, when I said being viewed as that business person, being viewed as understand, <clears throat> understanding what the strategy of an organization is. And if you notice here, strategy is on the left, but the human capital strategy is going to enhance the, the probability of achieving those targets. Hiring the, right, uh, hiring the right people, keeping them engaged, developing them throughout, retaining them, strategic workforce planning, deploying them into specific areas of the business if we're moving in that direction. I showed this slide, I gave a speech one time and I showed this slide and a gentleman uh, was very, very intrigued about it. And he, 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 he introduced himself, he was a professor of business. He was the chairman of the department of a major business school here in Dubai. And he told me that this is a very unique approach. He said, I teach strategy and I have never, kind of looked at it through this lens. In other words, strategy is created, but it's the people who is going to carry that out. We tend to create the strategy. Not a lot of time is spent on the human capital side, but we're looking for results. So we had a very long, extensive conversation concerning this. But what I walked away with, I thought of MBA schools across the world that's possibly that possibly has professors teaching the same model, business strategy, business results. And in and, and the center where we have human capital, they could possibly have something else. So how do we become that business person who is looking at the strategy through the lenses of what we do? We, we're making sure we're developing people, skill, uh, skilling, upskilling is, is, a, is one of the key topics today. We want to make sure our workforce is engaged. What's our sourcing strategy? And it just goes on and on. But what we're facing, we've never faced before. What we will face post lockdown, we've never faced before. So I would tell everyone, spend this time wisely because you're gonna be on the hot seat once the doors open in whatever manner doors open is going to look like. So today we're gonna to talk about some of the things that, <clears throat> that we're bucketed against. So I, I, I put together kind of eight key areas of forces that are shaping the, the future of work slash virus. For the past three days, I've been on possibly six or seven Zoom meetings, go-to meetings, whatever platform it is. 
and we're able to do business. We're able to talk about strategy. We're able to talk about upcoming events. We're able to talk about developing people all through technology. And this was kind of forced on us because we have to have some way to connect. What's gonna, how is that going to look move, going forward if we are somewhat in a partial lockdown? How can we institute technology into what we're doing? So in, under each one of these, what would be dependencies of bullet points under accelerating technological changes? How are meetings gonna be held? How can we change the way we look at recruiting people, whether it's through a virtual interview? Growing demand for skills. Human resources will have to upskill. I have a slide that's coming up. It's going to talk about uh, HR competencies. And they've been around quite a, quite a while. I use the SHRM model, but there's only one slice out of that pie that basically connects to human resources. It says human resources expertise. But there's a growing demand for skills. If you're in banking and you're transitioning to cloud banking, if you're in retail and you're transitioning to an e-commerce model, do you have those skills? Uh, there was a notice in the business news yesterday, Neiman Marcus, which is a very, very high-end store in USA, filed for bankruptcy. 130,000, I think it was, people that are going to be furloughed, slash, laid off, whatever. The retail sector will be severely hit. As you know, malls are closed down. Dubai Mall is closed. I think they're possibly going to open next week, but it's been closed for basically uh, three weeks. Changing employee expectations. What's going to happen when, how are we communicating with our employees now? Are we listening? Are we setting up calls once a week just to talk about well being? Some people may not be adjusting to working from home or they may not really have the facilities or the equipment to work from home. How are we going to address that moving forward? So there's so many factors, but we have time. We have time to address these. We have time to give it some thought. We have time to do some scenario planning. This work from home model, I was on, the, on a call with some people from Saudi Arabia and one person was saying they were very, very strict against working from home. Now everyone's working from home. Employees' expectations going forward will, will be wanting to maybe, if not full-time, maybe part-time. What is going to be the model 100% occupancy once we come back? Or are we going to have 50%? We're going to split the days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. All of these things are going to have to be discussed and leadership is going to come to us or be expecting us to have some kind of plan, a workable plan, or plan to begin the conversation because the work models are transitioning. The business environment is being disrupted. Um, my next slide is going to kind of give you an overview of what I picked up in the business news over the past two days. This is another thing I wanted to mention also, and I tend to ask HR people, do you read the business section of your newspaper every day? Or do you go to Google News or Facebook News or whatever it is and concentrate on the business section? Because you're going to have to, because all the cases that we're talking about is always in the news. So start thinking in future state and move away from current state. Current state will handle itself. But the need for our expert, expertise post-virus is going to be what scenario are we going to play in? So all of these are going to have a tremendous effect. How are we managing this crisis? I was vice president of human resources at Martha Stewart back in the early 2000s during the time that she went to jail. And I had to do a crash course in crisis management. But we did some very, very cool things. And matter of fact, a year or so after that, someone was doing a white paper on crisis management and contacted me and interviewed me 
to figure out how did you transition a workforce through all of that drama and your organizations being on the news every day, negatively impacting employee expectations, worrying about futures of their jobs and all these kinds of things. So one of the key things that I talked about is how are you communicating? Your organization must communicate with your people as often as possible. And if I was in this scenario every week, there would be a call, not relating to work, just a call, a well-being call. Because a lot of people are suffering working from home. I mean, it's great that first or second day, but after a while, you hit a wall. So a, a friend of mine posted the other day, said, I've been home, working from home not 16 days, but today I basically hit a wall. Everyone is going through that. If they haven't figured out a plan to, to deal with the day, the, you know, the entire uh, enormity of the eight hours or whatever it could be. This is what happened over the past, since, since Monday. Apple is delaying products, launches. I read an article about a Zoom layoff. 400 people logged into a call, received a link to, a, to a, a call. They thought it was an all hands on call. They logged into it. There was a recorded message that said everybody was going to be laid off, heartless. And I thought, where was the HR people when they came up with this uh, strategy? There's a bank here that's guaranteeing jobs. So, so in other words, you don't have to worry about that. Your, your salary is not going to be cut. We're gonna guarantee jobs through the end of the year. Imagine the relief of people who were working from home and figuring out, trying to figure out what's next. We read about massive layoffs. Neiman Marcus filed bankruptcy. If you're in the retail sector, you, you, you should be following the stores that are in trouble. You should be following the articles that are written about this transition to these new models to possibly get some ideas. Amazon workers next week will go on a nationwide strike. This is in the US because of work conditions, because of self distancing. How is that going to work in a logistics center? Now, when I saw that, I really came back to human resources again, because there's been talk of work conditions in these warehouses for some time. This has been going on for a long time and no one has addressed it. So now you have the repercussions, you're on the news, engagement is gonna fall through the roof, Plus your business has increased almost 35%. The data behind online purchases since uh, online penetration into the retail model since lockdown ha is up to about 45% now from 25%. All of this information was in the business news. So this is why I said <clears throat> in the scenario planning, you, we have to understand what's happening outside of our bubble to get a sense of, and maybe some direction as to something we can try internally. So three futures that HR must address. The future of the workplace post lockdown. What is that going to look like with self distancing? If that's an issue. People have been exposed to working from home now. They've been exposed to Zoom meetings, Skype meetings, all these kinds of things. Will they continue? Well, we still continue to address our people by email, which is kind of an old form of communication. Or will we set up WhatsApp groups? Or will we use Slack or some of these other type messaging systems? What's the strategy behind the communication internal strategy moving forward? How are we gonna communicate? Future of the enterprise. And that takes, if you think of, the, when I say the future of the enterprise, what I mean is that, What's gonna happen if I'm in the retail banking sector and we're moving to cloud banking? This may speed that process up. <clears throat> if I'm in retail and we're moving towards an e-commerce model, can they coexist? Some companies have shown they can, co they can uh, make that work. What's going to be our model? What's the scenario moving forward? This is why, we have to be in on these conversations post lockdown, or even if we're having them now, because <clears throat> we're the only ones inside of our organization that have the skills we have. We have. We're people experts. Accounting doesn't have it. The strategic strategy department doesn't have it. Marketing doesn't have it. We're experts in what we do, but we have to feel that. We have to exude that so that 
our business leaders see us as a comparable business leader. The only difference is our focus is on the human capital side, whereas the finance people, their focus is on the finance side. And we should feel at ease in these sessions. But I come back and ask you, pre-virus, were we sitting in on business meetings? Were we taking a part in those presentations at, at, at the end of the month or end of the quarter? Are those offsites or whatever model you were using? Was HR playing a role pre-virus? You're going to have to pl play a role post-virus. So start thinking, it, thinking now when you have the time as to how you're going to play this new role because your role is going to shift. Now, some of our roles, people will say, well, you know, I'm basically process driven. Yeah, that still would be important. But going forward, the organization is trying to figure out how they're going to survive moving forward. Your people expertise is going to be needed. GE, I think it was in, uh, in GE Healthcare, uh, automated 85% of their work processes. So think in terms of human resources, 85% of the process, the paper, was automated through AI, whatever uh, they used. So what happens to the skills of the human resources people? They upskilled everyone into this new strategic view of human resources versus another company who's looking to make the same move. And the first thing that came up in the conversation, we're gonna have headcount reduction of human resources staff, two different approaches. That may be speeded up and, and, and moving forward. So the future of the enterprise is gonna demand a new future for human resources. Take the time you have or what's left of that to begin thinking how is the new future focused human resources department going to evolve? If you go back to the forces that I mentioned, what would be your strategy under each one of those? And this should be a collaborative effort. So it's not that you're going to bring up all of HR in the room to solve something, because one of the premises of solutioning, of consulting, is that you get as close to the problem as possible. That, so that means you have to have, in collaboration, you want people from all various departments and you wanna also listen to people, um, to your workers in doing that. It's gonna demand new outcomes and HR has to play a critical role in moving forward. So this could be a possible scenario. Post virus hands-on meeting. So operating unit, technology, marketing, financial, everyone comes to that meeting prepared and they have their strategy as to how we're going to reach whatever that strategic thrust is. What's going to be our plan? Have we taken the time to look around that wheel? And I, I, and I will share my slide deck with everyone on the call. I'll send it back to, uh, to Quasi and his team and they can distribute it. But what's going to be human resource strategy? post virus, because all of these things are falling into our lap, whether we like it or not, it's falling into our lap and we're gonna to have to address it. Because if everyone else in the room is, is presenting their strategy, what's gonna be ours when it comes time for us? What's gonna be our strategic approach to this new workplace? And we have to be prepared. That's all I can say, we have to be prepared. So my, my thought would be start preparing now, start looking at scenarios, start having meetings with people inside of the organization, inside of the marketing department, inside of all of the others to get a sense of how are we going to be viewed in the new normal based on what we know at this point, because nobody really knows. And we're trying to figure that out. So here's the Sherm competency model. I want you to notice where HR expertise, HR knowledge is. It's almost as if this was written for a post virus. Because what it's saying here is that we need a new set of skills. If you look at every, if you look at any survey from senior leadership as it relates to uh, 
what they would want more from human resources. Number one, always is business acumen. Business acumen means I know the numbers. <coughs> I'm, excuse me. I know the basic numbers. I know the strategy of the organization. I know where we are at a given point. And most of all, you always want to be viewed as the business, as a business person with expertise in human resources. There's a lot more brand value being viewed as a business person versus being viewed as an HR person. The HR, those two letters, has a lot of baggage. And there's not a lot of good baggage. You know, luggage, the luggage tends to weigh us down as we try and move to a new role. So how are we going to be perceived? Follow business. Understand your business. The other I would talk to here was consultation. Do we actually know how to consult? If someone came to you with a problem, would you solve it for them within an hour or by the next day? Let's, let's use a metaphor of going to a doctor. You told the doctor your shoulder hurt. And if the doctor pulled out a script and wrote you a prescription or gave you a prescription that afternoon, <clears throat> possibly not a good doctor. But if the doctor asks you a set of questions, how much activity have you been doing lately? When did it start hurting? What area is the pain located? On and on and on. And then at the end of that, they said, well, I want you to go next door to get an x-ray or get an MRI or whatever, <clears throat> whatever it could be. They use the consult consultation approach. Consultation approach is based on two, on two foundations. The people I'm gonna talk to and what data do I need? Then and only then can they connect the dots and arrive at a solution. And if you look at any consulting model, solutioning is five or six steps, depending upon the model, away from the actual problem statement. But sometimes we don't use that. And, and our brand um, is, and solutioning is solving it from an HR point of view. So this is important. Take a look at this and try and score yourselves as to how do you fit into this model. If it's heavily focused on HR expertise, it shows you've got to upskill. I told, I, I said a, 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 a speech I gave, I said, we're no different than the person that's worked in a factory that's being threatened by robotics. We're no different because the robotics on our side be, be, can, could become an automated process, such as the GE that I used earlier. And then what do you do? If you have skills around this, you can still function in an organization and bring value to the role, the new role that you could possibly take. So in workforce planning, it's called scenario planning. And anyone that does strategy knows that they tend to spend some time on, on scenario planning is based on what if. What if this happens, we do this. What if this happens, we do that. Uh, is it guessing? Sort of. But there's market dynamics externally. There's market dynamics internally. Filtering it through that. There's industry knowledge. Where the industry is headed. So it's a little more scientific than just saying what if or you're just going into a room to brainstorm, as they say. So what's going to be the future of your organization? When I mentioned to you, Neiman Marcus, the article said the retail industry is in a death uh, spiral. That has to be disheartening if you've been in that uh, sector for some time. But this is what's happening. And the transition that your industry was making pre-virus has now been amped up it's been amped up because the new model is going to be different from the prior model. Future state is going to be different from current state. So how do we design that? I heard, uh, I read an article last night that says design with flexibility because maybe the model that you come up with, maybe six months out, you realize you've got to tweak it. There will be no end. You know, you look at a model and it says the end, you go through the step and says the end. There is no end anymore for anything you design. 
that end should say monitor and evaluate, which is based on design thinking. It's monitor and evaluate. So you design with flexibility. Here it says you design with agility. And are you going to be connected to the revised business strategy? You will have to get that seat at that metaphor table uh, moving forward. What is the people strategy that's connected to the revised business strategy? So in order to do that, you have to know what the revised business strategy is, which means you're going to have to sit or be a part of those meetings. So when I show the slice of the pie financial marketing operating unit and the HR piece was sitting out there, what is your plan? If you go back to the slide, it says business strategy and it says human capital strategy. Each one of those uh, sections, sectors, is going to have to be evaluated through what that business strategy is or may have to be re realigned. Maybe you've already done that. It's gonna to have to be realigned. If you have talent strategy that you've already developed, pull it out, dust it off, and take a look. And going forward, you're gonna to have to review it every month. And what I would advise everyone on the call is that you take the same model as finance. You close your books at the end of the month and you evaluate everything. That first month is going to be extremely important extremely important. You may want to create an advisory board. I was always big on creating an advisory board of a cross section of people throughout the organization and not all fills with managers and, and senior leaders. I had a senior leader component that I would stay in touch with from time to time, but I wanted my advisory board to be people throughout the org chart at all levels because I wanted the true picture and I wanted people to feel the trust that they could come to me and say, this is going to be a problem, or I don't think this is work, this is going to work, and this is why. So our model in interaction with our workforce is going to have to change. If we don't have the trust now, it's very important that moving forward, we have that trust. I had a, a, a boss that I worked for at one time, and she was laughing because of the fact that she said every time she went to one location, People ran into their offices and closed the door. People went to the bathroom because they didn't want to come in eye contact with her because they thought she was coming bearing bad news. And she laughed about it. And my question was, do you feel comfortable with that being your brand? So it says that they don't trust you because you are always the bearer of bad news. How are you viewed from your side? So if you think of the nucleus of the organization as being to human resources, human capital, whatever you're called. And then above that, you have senior leadership. And below that, you have the workforce. You're caught in the middle. You're cascading strategy initiatives down through the workforce. The workforce is telling you things and you're cascading or should be cascading that upward to the leadership. That model is more important now than it ever has been. Because we're playing that key role now. You know, so it was like, so there was a, there was a quote by, I forget the author's name, the best of times and the worst of times. Think of that. It is the worst of times, but it, as it relates to our profession, it's the best of times. If you're capable, of moving to the next level, proverbial next level, and having that interaction with, from both levels, that you're playing an integral part of driving that model, that new model forward. So it, the question comes back, is your organization fit for the future? I want you to think about that for a second. Is your organization fit for the future? Uh, Hassan, I'm going to ask you a question. You said that we would want to break maybe midpoint to see if there's any questions. Without... Yeah. Uh, yes, if, if you like, we can take questions right now. Other than that, we can take in the end. Okay, let's, let's, add, let's take some questions now while some of the thoughts may have been fresh in people's mind. 
All right. Uh, I would request the participants and if they have questions, they can raise hands and uh, they can find the option in the participants uh, tab. Other than that, they can ask questions in the chat and I can announce that question for, for the trainer. Okay, cool. We've covered a lot of different angles and um, I'm, I'm sure lots of times when I listen to, you know, people talking, there's certain things that kind of stick out and I may want some further clarity on it. So just going to kind of use this as opposed to finishing up the entire presentation and not really addressing it. Very quiet audience. Okay. Uh, I think no question has arrived. So one question has just arrived. Let me just check. Okay. Uh, Sunil Chepa has asked how to sensitize HR leadership about the need of the hour and usage of middle management in HR. How to sensitize? HR leadership about the need of the hour and usage of middle management in HR. Hmm. Okay. So the key point about moving forward is this collaborative model. So whether it's middle management, whether it's senior management, are they connected? And do we have that trust factor? And this comes back to an advisory board. This comes back to having people to bounce things off of. And if we haven't built it, it's important that we build it going forward. If we're at home now, we can always do a Zoom meeting with a section of the organization. And start engaging people now for a future focus of what, what the organization may look like. So use the time we have now for those key stakeholders, or sponsors, or whatever you would want to call them, and begin having conversations now but let the conversation be guided or strategic. In other words, if I'm going to be talking with this leader, the question you ask could go in a thousand different ways and it could be misinterpreted. But when you design interview strategy, what do you wanna find out from this person? If you think in terms of the outcome, what do I need to know in this one hour call with this leader and then you back it out and build your interview strategy around that. Because you have to be precise in what you're trying to find out. So in consulting, we always spent time, because part of my background was that I ran one of Xerox's uh, consulting practices. That was my last job in New York City before I moved to Saudi Arabia. And it was around, we spent, we spent time on interview strategy. So if you were going to meet a key leader of a prospective client, we spent a lot of time on designing the questions we were going to ask. You have to be focused now. So when a question came in, it was, I understood the question, but if, if I'm a middle manager or, or, or line manager, I may not understand what you're looking to get if we think of that. So what are you trying to find out? And how can I structure that question in a way to get that insight? Because if I ask a general question, I'm gonna get a general answer. General answers aren't good for solutioning because you need to dig deeper. So if you think of, uh, of the theory behind root cause, think of a tree the problem comes in from the branches. In order for you to get to root cause, if you look at that, there's a there's a there's a image online. And if you look at that image, what you will see is a shovel. And the shovel is about asking questions. In other words, you've got to dig down deep to get to that. Try and understand the relationship you had pre-virus whether it was with the line managers or the uh, senior leadership. And there should be some type of strategy to reconnect, reignite that relationship, especially at this point in time, how do we build on it? 
So one of the key points in crisis management is communicating. Are we communicating with that level now? Because we should be, as opposed to waiting the two weeks and everybody gets back and everybody's overwhelmed with all the work, the new model and all the questions. Use the time now to talk with that sector to get a better understanding of what do they see as the major challenges moving forward. A good model to use, I call it a three-step model to use to analyze anything is what's working now, what's not working, what can we improve upon to make sure it works better next time. Okay, you can uh, take any, sorry, sorry. what's that? Sorry, please carry on. I was yeah. about to ask you another question. Okay. So if you think of that, that's always should be in your toolkit. Because that three prong approach will get the conversation started. What's working, I can list what's working. I could say, get, give me three, three things that's working now in your department. And my follow up with that, and the reason I did that is because I'm forcing you to think of three things. And I could always flip that down to what's not working. So in, in, in interview strategy, it works like this. I can ask you multiples. I can ask you opposite. What's the greatest thing that happened? What's the worst thing that happened? Or I can do closed in. Closed in is yes or no. I need 18, whatever it is. So closed in in an interview strategy is normally the making sure that we understand each other before I walk out of your office. So think above. So when I talk about the scenario of the HR department being the nucleus, the nucleus, what's working in the communication between senior leaders and your department now? What's working between your department and the line? What can we improve on? But more importantly, having that conversation with them and not making assumption or coming up with hypotheses because it's, there's, a, there's a term that's called confirmation bias. And we try and fit the scenario into whatever our bias is. So I hope that gave some clarity, uh, kind of long winded, but I hope it gave some clarity. Hassan, you were gonna ask something? Yes, uh, there's another question by Hamad al Husni. He asked, do you think it is mandatory for every organization to have HR business partners? If yes, why? Okay, um, Dave Ulrich is a friend of mine and he designed the HR business partner model and back in the late 70s, the early 80s, whatever it is. Let's just take the title away. If I take the title of that, those four letters away and think of the person that's sitting in HR, if I go back to the competency model, that's a different skill set from an HR journalist, a strategic HR person. Because what's happened with that HR business partner, that title has just been distributed throughout HR departments and you're still doing process work or whatever it is. Not that that's a negative thing. But the downside of that is that it cheapened the HR business partner. I don't care what you call it. Someone wrote a critique on, on uh, on Dave's thought on the new model and it was called talent leaders or whatever it is. But again, we're getting into titles. Here's what I would go back to say. Are you enabling your organization to reach their strategic goal? Are you enabling your organization to become a high performance workforce? I don't care what title you have, but are you making a difference within the organization? Or you're seen as process executors. If you're seen as process executors and you're still an HR BP, that's, that's what it is. But the model of the business partner is more of a solution provider. Now, I, 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 tend, I tend to want to stay away sometimes from using the word consultant. But the skip, think of the skill set of a consultant. How do you solve a problem? If there's a challenge within your sector on employee engagement, and that's trending downward, year over year. If your performance, your performing workforce based on performance analysis is that we're not building a high performing workforce, that's an issue. 
If it's people related, it's ours. What is the solutioning process? How are you arriving at those solutions? You can call that person HRVP. You can call them whatever you want to call them. But if you're not having an impact on your organization, you're not doing the role for the future focus of human resources. A young lady that worked for me gave me a call. This is maybe six years ago. I hired her out of college. It was her first job in human resources. And she eventually became my training manager. And we parted ways. But she called me maybe five, six years after that and told me that she was had just gotten a promotion. And, and I said, well, what is your new role? I, she said, I'm going to be an HR business partner. I said, great, congratulations. Tell me a little about the role. And this is where it started going downhill. She said, well, I'm going to be sitting in marketing. And I said, sitting in marketing, doing what? I'm going to be HR's representative to marketing. So, so it's kind of like they're going to have their own HR department sitting in side of marketing. So I said, well, what would marketing need from you on a daily basis that you're going to be sitting there, sitting there doing what? And there was a pause on the phone and she said, you know what? I don't, I don't really know. She said, my head of HR went to a conference and they did a strategic partner, workforce partner workshop. She was very intrigued by it. And she came back and she said, we're going to use that model here. On Monday, you're going to go to marketing, you're going to go to finance, you're going to go here, 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 here. And that was it. So my advice to her was, if you go and sit with your chief marketing officer and you have the conversation and you respond the way you responded to me, you're going to be a high-priced uh, administrative assistant because they are looking for solutions. So what we did was work through kind of a scenario. How are you going to have this first meeting? Some of the questions you're going to ask. We talked about using a SWOT analysis, set up a time to use a SWOT analysis for that marketing department. What are the strengths of the marketing department, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? We all know what SWOT is, which is a tool that's being used now, by the way. So it's moved from the organization perspective. Now it's, you go down into teams if you're the HR business partner sitting in that team. That does a few things. It shows the marketing head, finance head, that you're approaching this and you're gonna be a solution provider because those weaknesses and threats, you're going to concentrate on which one of those in a priority matrix is more important to solve so that we can move that over to a strength. Or we take advantage of those opportunities. And that's what we did. And she went there and she used that. She called me very excited. Oh my, the meeting was great. He wants me to kind of be a sidekick, hanging with him, going to these meetings because I'm that HR person that he wants. He says, finally, I have someone that I could basically talk to because the other person that uh, I was dealing with in human resources on the other side of the building was always focused in process. So I hope that kind of gives you insight. HRBP is, a, some of the people on the call, are, I'm sure are HRBPs. I could have been considered in my prior part of my career as an HRVP, but I always try to focus on finding the challenge in that department or the challenge inside of the organization. And my goal was to solve that. So whether it's talent leaders in the next iteration, because this is being discussed now in the so-called higher circles as to what is, how is the HRVP going to evolve into something else? I don't care what title you give it. If you're not providing solutions to either your department of focus or your organization, you're not providing the value that an organization would need. And the reason it's important now, because think of the nucleus of the you're sitting in that middle, Organizations up top is looking for you to guide them through the new work model, the employee expectations, and employee is looking up, the employee group is looking up to you to provide some guidance, to provide some, some, some information as to what's going to happen moving forward. Because a lot of them are sitting at home now and wondering whether I'm going to have a job moving forward. So I applauded the bank here in Dubai that just took that off the table. There will be no layoffs. No one is going to lose their job through the remainder of the year. So that gave people breathing room. We don't know what's going to happen beyond that. But at this point in time in crisis, we have to become that empathetic organization. 
because people are struggling. You're probably struggling in the role that you're playing. I mean, meetings back to back, phone calls back to back, people asking you questions you don't know the answer. Start forming a group, start having conversations now because we have to get fit. It's, if you think in terms of you want to become in better shape, you go to the gym, well, this is gym time. Get fit now for the future. Oh, uh, so uh, Ron, uh, do you have more things to cover in your presentation or should I keep asking questions because I have a couple of more questions? Yeah, we have, we have time because I only have a few more, I only have a few more slides. All right, so, uh, I received another question. Mr. Suresh asked, what will be the future of hospitality sector? Uh, what will be the future of hospitality sector in terms of human capital? What do mm. you anticipate? Yeah. Okay, T to give some credence, I'm a, a, on the board of the hospitality uh, uh, group in Dubai. Then we have this big event every year where we honor all of it. So I, I tend to know that in industry a little bit. So I came across an article the other night, the future of hospitality, whether that be hotels, uh, restaurants inside of those hotels, the workers inside of those hotels, it's all up in the air and everyone is trying to figure it out. I did some work for Marriott maybe two and a half, two years ago. So if you think of the, that, that industry is transitioning into something else. And we had this uh, strategy workshop and we were talking about what is, does a Marriott see as their major competitor moving forward? This was two years ago. And it wasn't the Hilton. It wasn't the W. It wasn't any of these hotels. It was Airbnb, retail e-commerce, hotel to a sharing model. Excuse me. So what happened is that the... Uh, Marriott announced latter part of last year, their new division, which focused on the Airbnb model. Airbnb is struggling. Are people gonna feel comfortable renting a place and going in someone else's home? So everyone is struggling trying to figure this out. There will always be a need for the hospitality industry. I think from my vantage point, I tend to travel three months out of the year. I will always need a place to stay. I will always need some place to eat when I'm in a city. So some of the weaker competitors may not make it, but the hospitality industry as a foundation is built into our society. And it will be around, but maybe the model has changed. Now, what I would do if I were in your, your uh, industry, I'm gonna come back again to building up knowledge. Are you a part of the industry association? Are you following your industry newsletter? Because today you have to, because the industry newsletter is going to be focused on what is the future going to look like of our industry. So they have time to think about a future focus of the hospitality industry. So I wanna make sure I follow that. I can also set up a Google alert. I have Google alert on everything I'm interested in and I get reports from hospitality industries. All of that's free, but it's kind of self-educating because the model is going to change. And I want to know as much about the model or the perceived model on my own, as opposed to waiting to go back and getting in a room with all of our leaders trying to figure it out. I want to come out of my bubble to see what the industry is facing and what their conversation is with that. I cannot tell you how important it is to be a member of your industry organization and follow it and read through those articles. Know who the key people are in your industry. Connect with those people online. Connect with the industry groups on LinkedIn. Connect with the industry groups on, on Facebook. Use the social media side because the articles that are posted in those groups, lots of times someone comes across a great article and they plop it in here. So a lot of this is gonna be determined on self-learning. I mean, we can sit around and work for a few hours and do some TV or Netflix and all of these kinds of things. Or you can say, I'm gonna upskill and I'm gonna relearn my industry. And that's gonna come back to you 
because I gave you my views on it and my views could be totally wrong. But I gave you my views based on my vantage point of being on a plane once a week, flying into some country, going to some hotel to stay and finding some place to eat at night. But in order to get out of that bubble, self-educate either through a social, social media platform, and you'd be surprised the level of information that comes from a hospitality group on Facebook or even human resources group. We have one here in, in Dubai. The level of information, research studies, and all these kinds of things. So you have to stay in a learning mode. You have to stay in a learning mode because everyone is trying to learn now. Everyone is trying to get fit for the future. And fit for the future does not only mean the organization. How are you staying fit for the future? How are you getting in shape? You, so the term I use from time to time is you have to become a student of your industry and you have to become a student of your organization and you have to become the driver of your career. I can't tell you how important that is. Okay, okay. Uh, Ron, uh, I'm going to quickly take, take the next question. I will actually be unmuting the participant so that he can ask the question directly, all right? Okay, great. Hi, Ash, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, so you can please ask your question now. Right. Hi, um, Ron, thank you very much for your um, presentation. The question I had was um, around people managers and how can we actually support our people managers when, when the employees return to work in the future state? What do we in HR need to do to ensure that um, we can upskill that, that workforce? Okay. Uh, here's, here's what I would always use as kind of a barometer on that. For every level of increasing responsibility, there has to be a development component, number one. Has to be a development component. So if you think in terms of that, this new workforce, for this new model, if the model stays to work from home, that's a different skill set in managing people because I physically, I can't be in the room with you. How do you keep people motivated? The skill set for that is managing a virtual team. So the learning and development department has to get busy because if we move to this mobile way of operating model, everyone is going to have to go through that. Every mid-level manager is going to have to go through that. You're going to have to equip people with new skills to manage a different type work model. Now, maybe they weren't good managers in the first place, so that's always kind of a, a factor. But we're going to have to spend time on thinking about the skills of these new managers. Again, upskilling, because they're going to need to bring more to the table. How are we going to develop the manager? So if we look back to the wheel and it said train or develop, whatever that is, what is going to be the approach for the line manager who possibly is managing a team virtually and has never managed a team virtually, different skill set. How do you have those positive interactions online? Because I'm not in, in the room. And so this is why if you go back to the wheel, that kind of gives you some direction because whatever happens over here has to be adjusted over here. This changes, this changes, or some facet of it will change connecting back into the organization. So a different skill set you will need to manage people virtually if you've never done it before. The learning and development model as it relates to skill set. What skills are going to be needed moving forward? There's a, there's a, there was a famous case that I read about American Express uh, maybe three, four years ago. Could have been longer, but they were looking at their training department to see whether it was connected to the strategic initiatives of the organization or whether they were connected to the shift of that industry that American Express fit in. And what they realized, they offered, they were all they had was a training catalog because nothing in their portfolio was connected to advancing the skills inside of the organization as they met the winds of change that was coming through. So they ripped everything apart and started from scratch. And by starting from scratch, they approached it, but what is the strategy? What are we trying to accomplish? How do we skill people to accomplish that? So that entire L&D portfolio, portfolio that you have now, go back 
take a look, start talking with your LND people now and having these kind of future focused conversations. But virtual team, managing a virtual team is important. Now, there's a lot of webinars that you can find on managing a virtual team. But that may be something that you want to bring people in or, or you have one that basically focuses on that specifically to your organization. So, so I, I hope that helps. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so I'm unmuting uh, the next uh, question after the person. Mariam, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Hassam. Uh, hello, Ron. I am okay. Mariam from Islamabad, Pakistan. Thank you so much for uh, some great insights. You talked about agility and flexibility at one point, and I wanted to ask that, uh, you know, uh, could agile HR work in a conventional organization, in a conventional setup when organization is not agile enough? Do you think that agile HR would be able to survive in such kind of organization? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, so whenever I hear, I'm gonna say buzzwords, agile, innovative, out of the box. My vision of agile, and I hope it aligns with the question that you ask, is being able to respond to whatever's coming in my, it, it, coming in front of me. I can respond to that, I can make a pivot and move to something else. So if I'm working on an initiative, something else comes in. Regardless of whether the organization is, is, is works from an agile approach or whatever, and it may be like legacy organization been around X amount of years, we do it one way. What you're dealing with from an HR perspective, agility is, has, has to be a part of that because you're looking at all different facets. Those eight uh, bullets that I showed, all of that's coming to you. Now, if I prioritize, it could be around the skill set. It could be around the new work model. And I'm spending the, a majority of my time working on that. There's an exercise I, I tend to put people through, and that may give you some clarity. Think of the issues you're working on, and does it align to the organization? Well, it aligns to the organization, but under what thrust? Is it around engagement? Is it around performance? Does it happen a strategic impact if you were to solve it or you were to increase the viability of that, the issues that you spend time on? Because if you prioritized and looked at your time, where's your time spent? On the back end of that, what's the business outcome of it? If there's no business outcome or it doesn't, it doesn't equate to the organization becoming better fit, it may not be important. It may appear to be, but the issue that you're spending time with is not aligned to a major challenge within the organization, which could affect business outcome. It may not, you may not be using your time wisely. Now, sometimes you're you're given orders to do X amount of things and you work on that. But there's always time that you can squeeze away to work on something else that maybe you see an issue bubbling up. I, I dealt with a young lady from Microsoft in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and tell this story and this kind of, kind of makes sense. So she had what, however many open recs she had. So her job was full day to day. So we, were, we did an HRBP session and I always tend to ask people, what issue are you going to work on? Are you going to dig a little deeper on that you're not working on now? And she says, I'm going to look into, into turnover because turnover, we are losing a lot of engineers. And I'm going to take some time and I'm going to do that. So she said she took a half hour at the end of every day and went back to see who left the company. Where did they go? So like 100 people, 100 engineers left. And all of a sudden she saw a trend. The vast majority of those people that left went to a competitor of Microsoft who had just moved into Saudi Arabia, into Riyadh, and their sourcing strategy, we're going to poach Microsoft's engineers. They already the best because they only hired the best, and that was their sourcing strategy. She was able to figure this out, and at the next meeting, she got up and she walked the senior leadership through this, and they were absolutely blown away. That was an issue connected to turnover costs. That was an issue connected to talent. And she changed the trajectory of her, her job because 
the CEO or the MD was so impressed with her that he wanted her to become kind of a business analyst. And they pulled her out of recruiting to work more closely with the business side. Now, I'm not saying if you solve an issue, you're going to get promoted. I didn't say that. I'm saying it happened in this case. But the issues you're working on, are they connected to make an impact? Because if they are connected to make an impact, you're making a, a, a difference in the business. You're making a difference in, in to a business outcome. So there's something that's called a value chain. The value chain looks like this. HR lever is here. If I increase, decrease, or whatever I need to do for that issue, what's going to be the effects down the line? And what could possibly be the business outcome? So if you think of how you're spending your time, and being agile is that I see something or something's well, I want to question, you take time and, and, and you develop that. And if, if you, as you continue to make impact, the people that are above you, if they're smart, they would realize that you have a lot more talent than doing what you're doing and maybe your role could change or maybe you could have added responsibilities if that's what you want. So I, I hope that's the agile flexibility. Think of the issues you're working on and what does it equate to? If you just look at the issue and look across and it's, it's not going to have any so-called business impact, it's just something that you're kind of working on, maybe you can reprioritize and become a little more agile and look for challenges within the organization. So this is where the SWOT analysis comes in. And a lot of companies are using this now. Go through the SWOT approach with, your, with the team that you're sitting in, if you're HRBP sitting in that role. What are the strengths of the department? What are the weaknesses of the department? Threats and opportunities. I tell you, people that use that, the first time they use it, the feedback always is, oh my God, my marketing head was so excited because they said, you know, I never thought of using this in trying to diagnose my team. And basically you're using this as a diagnostic tool and you're trying to get inside the flavor of the organization. Okay. Okay, Ron, these were the questions so far. Uh, you want to please proceed towards your presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, is your organization fit for the future? Are you fit for the future? That should be the burning question for you. Now, we've all been on lockdown. I'm going to tell you how I've been trying to get fit. I wanted to, I, I, I know quite a bit, quite a bit, that could be with a question mark, analytics and data. I've always been intrigued by that. I've read some tremendous case studies of how organizations have done that. I don't want to become the statistician. I want to be the storyteller. I want to look at something and say, the reason we have these locations and the reason all of these locations are higher engagement is because of X, Y, Z. And the way, way that I know that is because we did a statistical model and we did this and this is what it showed. No one is going to question that. When I watch these updates from specifically New York City, the uh, Governor Cuomo, and the scientific people are talking about modeling. Key term, modeling. What is the future going to look like if we model? Statistically, you can do that. So I've been spending my time understanding modeling. I've been spending my time understanding more about strategy. Articles that are written as it relates to strategy today. How is that going to be disrupted? articles written as it relates to what is the new work dynamic going to look like? Because all of these things are enabling me to get fit in areas that maybe I wasn't concentrating on, but I know that my clients will be looking for solutions moving forward, and I wanna be fit enough to move forward. You wanna be fit enough that when your organization comes to you, you're in good shape, and you can start the process to move it forward. Strategies to respond to the outbreak, pre, post. What is that model going to look like? Uh, post virus, business continuity plans were not designed for this outbreak. How are we gonna communicate? What is gonna be the communication strategy going forward? Better still, what is the communication strategy now? Because you need to start communicating with these people now. Pull, pull a cross section of people together on a call, set up an advisory, work from home group, whatever you wanna call it, however you wanna brand it, and start talking to people. What's happening? What's happening good? What's happening not good? If we were to transition to another model, what are some things we should look at? Always think of this, in order to solve a problem, you have to get as close to the problem as possible. So that means it's not gonna be solved in a conference room. 
your people are going to have possibly the solutions to that. Listen to their concerns. HR role, aligning the organization, responding and communicating, getting this workforce fit into this new dynamic. Primary voice for overall strategy. That meeting is held in two weeks. Everybody's in the room. You're the HR rep. What are you going to talk about? How are you going to have that conversation? As an anchor, go back and look at the wheel, and you should have bullet points under each. And what you're going to do is weave a story. The overriding theme could be adjusting to the new work model. Here's our plan to do it. Here's different sectors. Here's what we're looking at. Not going into a lot of detail, but here's what it looks like. Because strategic is always from the higher level. Then you could always come back with the details later on. Update on changes. How are we going to do that? The communication change within. As part of that advisory board, if you have a PR department or a marketing department, they're schooled in using that. So the tools and resources you have within an organization, cool. Have those people a part of this advisory board. What's the ch challenge for people if we come back post-virus and we're self-distancing and they've got concerns around that? Who's going to be the contact person? So you already have that spell. So when they know when they come back, here's the contact person. This person has the answers. What's the recruiting strategy? Because that entails having people come from outside, inside. How is that going to look? If you've never used that before, maybe we spend some time now looking at various vendors and seeing how that works. Set up some calls and, and have them demonstrate it to see how it works. If you haven't used it already, a lot of companies are moving to that. Flexible work policies. How's that going to look? Working from home. I was on a call yesterday. I know we're running a little over, but I want to finish these, these thoughts. I was on a call yesterday. So I, I, I say that sometimes human resources always want to be perceived that we go into this police mode. So when the Q&A came up, someone asked, how do we make sure people are being productive while they're home? How do we make sure people are really working while they're home? And my, my, my thought was police, police, police. Well, the manager is dealing with that person and the manager is on calls with that person. Certain deliverables are due. You may have a team of 10. If that one person acts out, deal with that. Don't think about putting a policy in. If you do this, we're gonna do that. Flexibility now. People are adults. We hire adults, give them an opportunity to be adults. If someone acts out, you deal with it. You, if you have kids, if you have, if you have multiple kids, because one act out, do you put all of them on lockdown? No, you deal with the one who acted out and, and you move on from there. HR front and center. What's the well-being, safety of employees? These are going to be their concerns. New forum for people to be heard and taken seriously. Empathy, understanding, transparency. One call a week. Could, and the CEO could, all hands on deck. How's everybody feeling? This is not a business call. Just wanted to do a check-in to make sure everything was okay. Here are some preliminary plans we're thinking about. If you have some ideas, send, us, send them over to this contact person. We're looking for help. Which This is a new uh, area we're moving into. Everyone can play a role. If, you've, if, if something's working for you, let us know so, so we can share that. We're all in this together. That's the empathetic side of that cold-blooded organization. Support and coaching, learning and development. We have to think in terms of how do we develop managers to become coaches. If coaching is on your agenda, I want you to search for Project Oxygen, and Project Oxygen slash Google. It was a very famous case study, 2008 and 2016, on coaching. Coaching came to be number one in moving that forward. In closing, Starbucks says, we're in the people business serving coffee, not the coffee business serving people. We are business people, and we just happen to sit in human resources. We're the nucleus. We're the people, strategic, people strategy department. And going forward, we're going to be needed now more than ever. So thank you very much. Um, if I'm going to send a copy of my deck over. Um,
to Hassam. And if you need a copy of it, that's fine. Uh, use it as you wish. And if anyone uh, needs to contact me, you can always contact me through uh, Hassam Akwazi. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, and everyone for joining us for the session today. Uh, I hope you find that entire presentation and uh, lecture very uh, informative. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.